I am blessed and so fortunate to have this beautiful time. I'm thanking God for the Lord and I'm thanking all the uh, leaders who have given us this day and given me this time to share a few things from the Word of God. Let me pray first. Precious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing us here together. We praise you and we honor you. We are here to know more about you again. Help us to understand your word clearly. Use me according to my preparation. Bless us all together. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. The hymn singing was, uh, goes well with our text this morning. And I, I thought it was very, very profound song for this morning. And Sister Nipokrino, you are, I assume, you reminded me of something <laughs> which is coming up now. Uh, Father, <laughs> forgive them. <laughs> oh, that was. Uh, that, that's how I feel the word. For the freshest. I just want to tell you that I created a history on Easter Sunday morning. <laughs> I was on the cross and I shouted to the Lord God that to forgive for the that for they do not know what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. More about it. Thank you so much for loving me. Oh uh, Alan John Chow or John Alan Chow. An American evangelical uh, Christian missionary came to uh, India, Andaman and Nicobar uh, Island, and uh, specifically in North Sentinel Island, where he served. And he was killed there. He was very young. Uh, he was born on 18 December 1991, one year older than me, and died. On 17 November 19, uh, 2018, very young, just like us, most of us. He was spirit. Can you imagine what kind of pain he was going through at the moment? As I prepared these texts, I was reflecting about this a uh, specific, uh, specific uh, story about uh, John Allen Chow, how he was killed. And I started uh, Googling and then uh, about more information about how he died. He was terrible. We have chosen the right person. We don't know where our future lies. We are here, committed to serve. Living God by thinking in heart that whatever comes in future, we will bear. That's the commitment. Before I started theological uh, journey, the BTH, I, I I told to my mom that I want to. I, I will. It was uh, after declaration that I would go for theological studies. Uh, I was in class twelve, and I, I told my mom that. In future, if I die in ministry, don't be sad. That's what I told him. And after a few months, <clears throat> when I uh, we, we called the convert, uh, the convert members, uh, and then prayer warriors to pray for me as I start, uh, uh, I, as I come and join Shalom for theological studies, my mom started crying there, and I said. Uh, in the midst of uh, while, while uh, she was crying, I said, I, I told you not to cry when I die. And I don't know where my future will go, but I have committed my life to Jesus Christ. And that's why we are here. And I want to remind our final years, uh, especially those who are in final semester now. Your seniors, we, we are your seniors. We welcome you with, with this song. I will let you. Uh, I will let, let you uh, listen again. And uh, 
This was written by one of my classmates, Cecil Abigail. Dreams one by one dreamt, goals one by one set, yet you chose to give it all away for Jesus. And we say you have not chosen the safest path. The path you have chosen seems insurmountable, but it's going to be worthwhile at the end. Today, we welcome you on this journey, a journey to learn of His purpose, a journey to discover oneself, a journey to grow spiritually, and to be called a disciple of Christ. May you find what sets your heart on fire. May your burden be lifted. May your past never hinder you again. May the grace of God be sufficient for you. This was a song we sang and we welcome you. And then after uh, somewhere 37, after 37 days, you will go to Mission Field. Some, some of you, especially PTAs, you will join uh, further study, uh, you will go for further studies. We don't know where our future goes, but we have, chose, we have chosen the right person. Now, Acts chapter 7, verses 54 to 60. When we read this text, it is very much important to know the immediate context that it is, uh, you know, that, that points what we are uh, about to talk about. And starts from the immediate context, starts from Acts chapter 6, verse 1 to 7, verses 1 to 7. In this text, the disciples have decided to choose seven more leaders or more uh, leaders for God's ministry. By knowing, when, by seeing the, uh, in the condition of increasing the believers that moment and those days. So seven new members were chosen. Among these seven new members, Stephen was also included. And in the text it says, Stephen was recognized. So Stephen is recognized in the text as someone who was filled with the Holy Spirit. Filled with the Holy Spirit. He was, uh, he was one of the persons who used to distribute uh, after fellowship to widows and poor people. And then he was promoted to this uh, for, for uh, you know, they, they, the leaders have uh, seen uh, capacity in him and then given him to be included in this chosen seven disciples or followers of Christ. When we read verses 18, 8 to 15, Stephen performed great wonders and signs among the people. Out of jealousy, people started arguing with Stephen against the things he has been doing in the text. So they bought people, they hired people who would speak in favor of them and blame Stephen. We see that Stephen was summoned to the Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin is a place where the, uh, the leaders used to gather. The 70 leaders of five districts, they would gather and then they would discuss uh, probably theological things. And then Stephen was summoned among these leaders and he was asked, what he has been doing. And you know the amazing thing? He explained the entire Pentateuch in front of his leaders. And he defended by saying that Jesus is God. And he defended Jesus as God by telling them that God is not limited inside the church or inside the synagogue or synagogue. And for which he said he saw God, Jesus, standing right hand of the Father, which we will discuss. Now, Acts 7, 54 to 60. I have been keeping in mind this background. I have endured this today's sharing as Stephen the model. The model. Stephen the model. So what is the meaning of model? Simply means to make ourselves, ourselves with uh, someone. So as we as we discuss about Stephen's life, I believe that at the end we will have the understanding of what a model is and how Stephen can be modeled for us. Verse 54 
our text starts with when the members of the Sanhedrin heard this. So what did they hear? If you read, uh, if you read chapter seven, verse one till uh, till fifty three, you see explanation. This Stephen is explaining entire Pentateuch to these people, the law, the the law teachers about which they only knew. He is explaining them. Meanwhile, uh, 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 heard this means when, when, when the leaders of the Sanhedrin heard Stephen defending Jesus as God, the leaders of the Sanhedrin were furious and gnashed the teeth. Gnashing of teeth can be understood in two, two ways. First, when you are set, when you are set in your heart, you gnash your teeth. Second, person gnash teeth when the person is in anger or anger. So it is sure now that these people were not sad, but these people are angry right now. For which Luke says the leaders were furious and nested teeth. Nation of teeth, uh, this, uh, like, like I, uh, I explained, in, uh, this can be understood in two ways. However, here, nation of teeth means all the leaders who have heard about whatever Stephen has said in the text was kind of blasphemy for them about God. Now, 55, verse 55, Luke says, But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, full of the Holy Spirit, uh, he, he looked up to heaven and saw glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. The word, full with, full with Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. We see in Acts chapter 6, verse 3, Five and eight, where people recognize Stephen as filled with Holy Spirit, and he has kept this consistently. His spiritual life uh, has been kept consistently with God, and he is living the life. Verse fifty-six, uh, the the statement Luke uses: here, "Look up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God." The word of Stephen makes, make, makes clear that God of Old Testament and New Testament, which I've said in the uh, earlier part of our sharing, that God of Old and New Testament is not limited in the temple. He saw Jesus out of the temple in heaven. That contradicted with the ideas and philosophies and teachings of the low teachers teachers of the law. Verse 56, look, he said, I see heaven open. The verse uses the term son of man is used last time here, last time for the last time here, uh, apart from uh, Jesus in, in the in first, uh, first five books of the New Testament, apart from Jesus Christ, Stephen is the only person who used this word. Son of man, he used. And this is the only time, like I mentioned, in the first five books of the New Testament. This is to signify that Jesus is the Messiah. Son of man was prophesied by prophet Daniel, if you remember. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 to 14. And if you remember, in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus said, you will see the Son of Man at the right hand. And Stephen have seen Jesus Christ standing at the right hand of the Father. According to Luke, Stephen saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. This gives the understanding of Jesus' greatness and power. And the statement of Stephen was overloaded for the teachers of the law because they consider it as blasphemy to God. Remember, we are called to speak the truth. And when we speak the truth, people will go against you. When you do good things, the crowd will stand against you. The best example we see here in this text is this guy, this Stephen, is not compromising. He is continuing, uh, he, he, is, he is saying, look, in biblical term, the word look means to give 
full attention. Listen to it and do it. And he said, to this crowd, leaders, to the leaders, he said, look. When he said, look, he was telling them, listen to me carefully. And verse uh, 57, we see here, at this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him. When he said that, look, you all the leaders, these people covered their ears and started shouting and rushing toward this Stephen. And you know why they, uh, you know why they uh, covered their ears? They decided that not to listen any word from Stephen. You know why they shouted? They shouted because if Stephen says something, they will not be distracted. Whatever they have decided, they will do now. That's the intention of these two words. Shouted, yelling in loud voice, and covered their ears. After that, what happened? They dragged him out of St. Hedron and out of the city gate and started stoning him. The blasphemy were to be punished by death, according to their context and their history. In tradition, the blasphemers were stoned as punishment. The verse says, Meanwhile, the witness laid their coats at the feet of the young man named Saul. This statement gives the understanding of Saul approving people to punish. Saul, a young man, was charged to approve the death of the blasphemous people who were persecuted those days. And verse 59, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. This verse gives the understanding that Stephen knew everything about Jesus Christ. I was thinking as I was preparing this, how well we know about Jesus Christ. You see, in verse 59, Two important things we, we, we can understand here. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And in six, uh, verse 60, we see, Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold his sins against them. Number one, first we see, Stephen is repeating what Jesus has said on the cross. Stephen, Stephen of the real term, what Jesus has said on the cross. First, he asked Jesus not to hold sins, people, uh, uh, sins of the people, at the, the, the people who were committing, uh, stoning him. On the cross, Jesus submitted his spirit to the Father. Here, Stephen is submitting his spirit to Jesus. How well versus we are. Some of us have just started our journey, theological journey. Some of us in the second year, and some of us will go out after uh, graduation. How well versus we are. I am including myself here, my dear brothers and sisters. This is a challenge for me. Verse 66, then he fell on his knees and cried out. Now this cried out, when Luke used this word or this term, he was not talking about the prayer. Or he is not talking about cry literally of the Stephen, but Luke is saying that Stephen knelt down while people were stoning him, and he cried and prayed to the Lord, and he submitted his spirit to God. It seems scary for our future, but this is true. Lord, do not hold these sins against them. Remember in the beginning I said on the cross. I was supposed to say the same statement here. But when he said this, he fell asleep. Remember, beautifully Luke used the term, he fell asleep. Intentionally, what Luke is trying to say, I tell us, is that those who follow Jesus Christ will not die. The believers sleep. When Christ comes, everybody will be resurrected. That's, that, that's what we are learning here. When Luke used, he fell asleep. And if you remember, 
Jesus standing, you know, with his right hand, receiving the spirit of Stephen. Intentionally, Luke has used this term that believers will not die. They will sleep for some, some time. Now, Stephen was filled with the Holy Spirit. What about us? Are we filled with the Spirit? I'm asking this because the same Spirit we are worshiping. The Spirit that we worship is not different from the, uh, the Spirit which Stephen is worshiping. Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? And we all must remember that we worship the same Spirit. According to the text, Stephen was in front of the leaders and he delivered the speech. The Pentateuch claims that it has 187 chapters. Stephen explained that in little more than one chapter. And Pentateuch claims to have 5,853 verses. Here in this text, entire Pentateuch, Stephen has explained in only in verse Verses 53, how well verses we are about the Word of God. Few things to keep in mind. Stephen put Jesus above the law or laws, which caused the leaders to drag him out of the Sanhedrin and started stoning him. Where are you putting Jesus Christ? Second, the gospel must not be compromised with anything and with any kind of philosophies of this world. Remember, we are living in a generation where everything, every evil things are considered as it's okay. But the text is telling us that compromise. Third, Stephen proves Jesus' resurrection. The text says Jesus standing in the right hand of the Father is enough for us to know that Jesus rose from his death. That's why he so now. If in future, if your non Christian friends ask you, isn't Stephen stupid who died for someone else? Tell them that yes, he was stupid for the right cause. If they ask you, isn't Stephen nonsense? Tell them that yes. He was nonsense for God. He acted like nonsense for God. And this is how he defended God in this text. If you read carefully this text, you see the most beautiful text which gives us understanding of how to defend Christian faith. The apologetics text. At the end, Stephen was neither nonsense nor stupid. That's why he chose to follow Christ and die for him. He knew that he was following the truth or the true God. And that's why I say Stephen, the model for our generation. He's the model. Let us lead life where we should be. Let us not be distracted by things. And again I say, Stephen is the model for our lives. Thank you so much for listening to the word of God.